This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome to the third and final part of my breakdown of Breaking Dawn by Stephanie Meyer. For the first two parts and the reviews of the other three books of the Twilight Saga, do avail yourselves of this convenient playlist. Right. I feel the need to start this particular episode with an apology about the last one. I made a typo in the timecode that was there to help people skip past the verbal description of the gory birth scene and as a result, it dropped people right into the middle of the worst part of that scene. It also somehow did not occur to me just how redundant it was to put the graphic content warning after showing a graphic visualization I made of said content. All I can say is I am so sorry, I think reading the entire Twilight Saga has actually made me significantly dumber. For those of you who can forgive me, here is a super condensed version of Book 3 of Breaking Dawn. Hooray! I'm a vampire now! What's going on here? <gasps> vampire mummy punch! I just had a vision that the Vulturi are coming to kill us all, so good luck with that. Goodbye! have committed very naughty vampire crimes. No, we haven't. Yes, you have. No, we haven't. Oh. Okay, then. And now, because I had to suffer through it so you do too, here is the long-form version. The first part of Bella's book retells some of the birthing scene again from her perspective. Oh good, I was really hoping I would get to immediately relive that. She then goes through the long and immensely painful experience of becoming a vampire. She is paralyzed but feels the venom spreading throughout her body, burning away the human flesh and replacing it with super tough vampire matter. Because the entirety of their collective experience with newly created vampires has led them to believe that there's an inevitable period of crazed animalistic bloodthirst and uncontrollable rage, the Cullens spend the majority of the book treating Bella like an unstable bomb that could detonate at any moment even going as far as to insist that she go out hunting for the first time before letting her see her own baby. However, it turns out Bella is the first ever vampire to skip this stage of development completely, and she shows total control and utter calm from minute one. The one exception being when she finally finds out Jacob has imprinted on her kid, but let's face it, that's a perfectly understandable rage anyone would feel. She tries to deck the wolf boy, but young Seth jumps in the way and gets his arm broken for his trouble. As I mentioned in the last episode, Bella's initial homicidal rage at finding out that her child is already earmarked as a future werewolf broodmare was one of the only moments of sanity in any one of these books regarding imprinting, and her coming around and accepting it as something beautiful throughout the rest of the book was one of the most horrifying things in the saga, and that is really saying something. There's a half-hearted attempt to glorify this child bride situation because the impending vampire werewolf battle to the death is well and truly off now. Apparently, there's a hard law that Jacob forgot to mention his quarter of the book that says no werewolf is allowed to hurt anyone who's been imprinted on, so... Yay, grooming for the win. Incidentally, Bella decides to name her daughter Renezme, a name that she created by combining the first names of the child's grandmothers, Renee and Esme. Renezme. Renezme, half human and half vampire, appears to have already aged a few weeks in the days since her birth, and she doesn't appear to be acting like a normal baby, having much more developed mannerisms and obvious thought process. She can also transfer images or memories into a person's mind through physical touch, because why not? Everyone else in this little Justice League gets their own superpower. The cons reveal that, as a Death Day gif, they have built Bella a house to bonk Edward in. We also learn that the Cullens, like all vampires, have been sex craze this whole time and we're just hiding it really well, which is both obviously a retcon and also very funny. That said, now that I've experienced Maya's attempts at being titillating, I almost feel bad for analysing and mocking the total celibacy of the last three books. It's so awkward and forced it honestly feels like reading smut written by your mother. Even though Bella continues her streak of immediately being a better vampire than all the other vampires, it's still reluctantly agreed upon that it would be best if she and Edward skipped town for a few decades 
it's because it's just not safe for her to be around her old human friends and family. When Jacob realises that his sex baby is going to be taken away from him, he takes it upon himself to transform into a wolf in front of Bella's father Charlie and invites him over to see everyone. The family manages to hide just enough of what's going on to not give Charlie a heart attack and he eventually decides he would rather live in ignorance and just accept that he's got a really weird daughter and granddaughter now. And because this leads to her getting to have her cake and eat it regarding being a vampire and staying in touch with her family like she always wanted, Bella decides to immediately forgive Jacob for this blatant act of manipulation that endangered the life of her father and the security of her child. This far into these books, I'm not going to pretend like I'm even a little surprised that unforgivably vile and selfish behaviour remains unrecognised and unpunished, but God's Damn it, it still infuriates me to read. Three months pass, a statement that was, according to Maya, the hardest thing to write in the entire saga, because she freely recognises she's obsessed with writing minute by minute. Renez May continues to age at an accelerated rate. It's predicted she'll reach adulthood in six years and then stop ageing altogether because... You know what? I don't actually care enough to question these things anymore. I just... Don't care. While on a nice little mother-daughter groom wolf hunting trip, Renez May is seen by Irina, a vampire who's been mentioned a few times but never featured directly in the story. She was a friend of the family, but she's been kind of pissed at them recently because she was quite fond of Laurent, the vampire that Jacob and his crew ripped apart when he tried to eat Bella back in New Moon. A little later, Alice gets a vision that Irina had mistaken Renez May for a full vampire child, assumed that Bella must have turned her, and run straight to the Volturi to snitch on her because because, as has been discussed in episodes past, that's the biggest no-no in all of the unwritten laws of vampiredom. They scramble to come up with a plan and eventually decide to summon every vampire and werewolf they know to form an army, in the hopes that having a smaller but significant force opposing them will make the Volturi hesitate long enough for them to prove that Renez May isn't what they think she is. They lose a bit of faith in this plan when Alice, their future seeing vampire, and her boy toy Jasper cheese it off into the sunset. She leaves a note behind that basically boils down to, sorry, I have to go and do cool shit off screen, peace out, but of course the vampire dum-dums in this book immediately assume that she saw that it was hopeless and had abandoned them to save herself, leaving no option but to prepare to fight the Volturi to the death. However, Bella notices the farewell note is written on a torn out page of her copy of The Merchant of Venice, and finds a second note in the book that starts on a super secret side quest to complete before the battle. I'm not going to go into all the details right now because it turns out to be the most time-wasting, utterly pointless, tangential red herring that has ever been committed to paper. Anyway, a ton of allied and neutral vampires turn up to hear the Cullens out and are brought around by Renez May, who can expedite the explanation process by transmitting the truth straight into their brains. As per usual, each and every one of these minor side characters seems to be infinitely more interesting than the white bread leads of this Stupid story. Of course, the effect is somewhat lessened by the presentation, which is basically three chapters of a laundry list of names, a brief description of powers, and backstory cliff notes. Somebody eventually notices that Bella's former natural immunity to Edward's mind reading has been increased by her vampirism and now can be projected outwards as a giant force field that stops any and all vampire powers from affecting those within it. Usually, this sort of power takes decades, if not centuries, to master, but Bella, vampire extraordinaire, masters it in days. Everyone kind of collects effectively knows that the Volturi have been waiting for an excuse to attack the Cullens for ages and either kill them all or force the ones with the best powers to become their own personal henchmen. This eventually leads to a Council of Elrond moment where everyone pledges to fight if they have to. Edward makes a half-hearted attempt to teach Bella how to use vampire kung fu but just can't bring himself to fight with her because it's too upsetting for him to imagine her as an opponent and think of ways to defeat her. Dude. Get over yourself, you're on the brink of war, you're supposedly one of the best fighters in your army. Put away your sensitive little feels and teach your wife how to defend herself. Jackass. Eventually, the big day comes. The good-ish vampires and the werewolves versus the much larger army of Volturi, who turned up with a ton of independent vampires that came along to witness the proof of the crime and the punishment. I know the different Volturi have names, but I defy you to give a shit which is which when you take Michael Sheen out of the equation. Proving Renez May isn't a vampire is fairly simple, so the Volturi switch to various other methods of proving them guilty of doing something, or trying to bait them into attacking first. Eventually, 
Basically, the excuse they land on is no one knows what half vampires will be like when they're fully grown, so for the sake of everyone's safety and secrecy, they have to kill everyone now. They start firing off magical attacks at them, which is usually enough to completely steamroll opponents, but they can't even put a dent in Bella's super shield. Then suddenly, Edward feels Alice approaching and can psychically read her intentions. He tricks the Volturi into loudly agreeing that if they can prove adult half vampires are harmless, there would be no need to fight, and then what do you know? Alice pops up with an adult half vampire she's gone and found, proving there are a few kicking about after all, and they do in fact remain chill forever. And the Volturi? give up. They accept there's no excuses left to justify killing them and go home. Everyone congratulates themselves despite knowing full well the Volturi will try again eventually and be more prepared next time. Bello and Edward talk about how nice it is that Jacob doesn't seem to be too impatient for their daughter to reach age six so they can start having sex with her. <laughs> And Bella figures out she can control her mind shield completely now and switches it off, letting Edward read her thoughts for the first time and see just how much she loves him. The end. Apparently, this last event was Maya's favorite Edward Bella moment of all of her books. This is the moment, after all these years, that Edward really gets to understand how Bella feels about him, and they're finally truly seeing eye to eye for just that moment. For me, it was like four books of build-up for this moment, and it was great. The implication being this character she created to be the too perfect to be real partner is incapable of relating to or empathizing with his wife without being able to read her thoughts and memories. There is so much padding in this part of the book, getting through it is what I imagine it would be like to die and get trapped in purgatory for all of eternity. The best example is the red herring quest that Alice sends Bella on with her secret note. It leads to a suspicious guy in the middle of the bad part of a city who forwards her onto a businessman who runs a side gig forging passports. Bella realizes that Alice wants to give her a way to save Renez May, so orders passports for her and Jacob. But because of course she wants to make sure she can stay with the adult man who intends to bonk her someday. She then comes back a bit later to pick them up and has to reassure the nervous man that this isn't part of a scheme to kidnap a child. Then of course this just turns out to have been a last resort backup and or a way to throw the Volturi off Alice's trail. It effectively amounts to nothing. It served something of a purpose in the narrative, because it makes Bella believe that things really must be hopeless if Alice is making plans for Renezme to escape alone, but the same impact could have been achieved with one-tenth of the excruciating detail that was put into every step of this journey. There's a whole extended conversation with the middleman as Bella tries to figure out what the hell she's supposed to be looking for on the fly, and then she bonds with the bloody criminal and finds out that Jasper's been bullying the shit out of him to make sure he never double-crosses his vampire customer customers, and it all leads to nothing. Maya could have covered the entire second encounter in a sentence, but it just goes on and on and on. This red herring takes up massive swaths of this bloated book and it leads to nothing. I want the time I spent reading this meandering pointless drivel back, damn it! Give me my time back, Stephanie Meyer! In addition to this and other excruciating tangents, the book is further expanded to agonizing length by Meyer's minute-by-minute -minute method of writing. I don't think there was a single scene in this that didn't outstay its welcome to the point that I yearned for the sweet release of death. Meyer's vague attempts to provide a semi-scientific explanation for Renesmee and her hybrid species ended up being about on par with Edward's venom penis. The backstory for the last-minute new guy is a particular vampire called Johan has been bouncing around impregnating human women because he believes he can, through this human experimentation, create a master race. Stephanie Meyer, back away from the heavy racial subject. You are not in any way equipped to write about a heavy racial subject. It would be a little unfair to say that the ending to Breaking Dawn is climax-less, it just felt like it because it wasn't the climax people were expecting. The scenario that Maya was trying to set up was the Volturi knew that their power over the vampires of the world depended upon at least appearing to not be tyrannical, so they needed their witnesses to see that a crime had happened or find some other clearly justifiable excuse as to why the slaughter was for the good of all vampire kind before they could attack. So it basically became a courtroom drama. 
the Volturi made their accusation, the Cullens made their defense and presented their evidence, the Volturi tried another argument, the Cullens responded, the bad guys start playing dirty and murder one of their own witnesses with a flamethrower under the guise of punishing her for spreading misinformation, knowing that members of the Cullens army were her relatives, so the good guys have to react super fast to physically restrain them and stop them from starting the battle. It goes on and on, a game of mental chess, move and counter move until the good guys maneuver them into a checkmate and the Volturi decide it's just not their day and they'll come back another time. Maya has divulged her reasoning for this not with a bang but with a shrug ending. I'm not the kind of person who writes a Hamlet ending. If the fight had happened, it would have ended with 90% of the combatants, Colin and Volturi alike, destroyed. There was simply no other outcome once the fight got started, given the abilities and numbers of the opposing sides. Because I would never finish Bella's story on such a downer, everybody dies, I knew that the real battle would be mental. I have to admit, I do grudgingly respect the fact that she always wrote her books how she wanted, regardless of what she was told was expected of them, and that attitude had worked out for her in the past. I'm still working on unraveling the mystery of Twilight's success, but it undeniably did resonate with its audience in a way that no one predicted. In other circumstances, this might have been a perfectly acceptable way to end a saga, the obvious problem being Maya building up the inevitability of an epic battle as far back as New Moon and dedicating the entire second half of the last and the longest book to preparations for it, including introducing all of these semi-interesting characters and their combative magical powers. The Chekhov's gun that Maya loaded was an M134 minigun mounted on an armor-plated military vertibird hovering menacingly over the stage. Now, to be fair, Maya attempted to counter this slightly and foreshadow the end of Breaking Dawn being a battle of wits with nearly a drop of blood spilt by name-dropping the Merchant of Venice over and over again, as Shakespeare's play also ended in a high-stakes legal drama centered around avoiding a horrible death. But of course that is nowhere near sufficient to undo everything that was done to set up the fight before and after. The ending worked in The Merchant of Venice because it was always clear to the audience that the battle of wits was what was being built towards. Another thing to consider is, if Breaking Dawn really was written in its entirety right after Twilight was finished, then Maya always knew that she was never building towards the Volturi being overthrown. So why would she go to such great lengths to show how cruel they are and how many people are dying at their hands every day in Italy or reveal that even though they pretend they're all about protecting the safety of their species, they're actually just power mad tyrants with no real sense of responsibility towards anyone but themselves. It ends up being the last entry on a massive list of reasons why all the good guys in this story are kind of selfish, terrible people and I hate to say it, but because this seems to be yet another thing that Maya seems to be utterly unaware of judging by the way it's treated in the story, it reflects disturbingly badly on her mindset and the mindset that she expects her audience to have. She clearly expected the people who read this book to agree with the sentiment that it's much better to allow the Volturi to continue to gruesomely murder and feed on a busload of unnamed but utterly innocent people on the regular than for some of the characters that we know to die at the end of the saga to stop it. This well, as long as it doesn't affect us, attitude has been pretty consistent throughout every book. Bella not giving a shit that Edward spent 10 years killing people, no one suggesting they lift a finger to stop Victoria from murdering a percentage of Seattle before they found out she was headed their way, then no one making an attempt to protect their prisoners of war from gruesome execution, and new vampire Bella controlling her urge to hunt someone, not because, you know, it's wrong to kill, but just because it might have been a friend. Don't get me wrong, I know the good vampire who fights to protect protect people from other vampires has been done, it would be wrong to insist that Twilight is inherently flawed just because it doesn't follow exactly the same established genre tropes as other vampire stories, but I can't not react to how this unwavering self-centered behavior reflects on these people as characters and it's badly. Another problem is how contradictory things end up being for this setup to even appear to make sense. The Cullens knew from the start that the Volturi were not going to play fair and would almost certainly find a way to attack no matter what, so for them to not have just given up or tried to run away, there had to be a reasonable chance they could defend themselves. However, for the battle of wits to have any weight or stakes whatsoever and not just be a waste of time before starting the real battle, there had to be no chance of them winning if it came to all-out combat. 
Maya's solution was to constantly introduce new developments that changed their chances of survival, and a massive side effect of that was the extraordinarily inconsistent tone of the excruciatingly long build-up to the end. First, everyone despairs when they realize the Volturi are coming, then they have hope when they successfully raise their own army, then despair again when Alice nopes out because they assume she must have foreseen defeat, then there's hope again when Bella finds her hidden note, then despair again when it turns out to just be setting up an escape plan for that demon baby, then they have hope yet again when Bella develops a superpower that could protect them, then they all despair again when the Volturi turn up with more numbers than they could conceivably fight, then more hope when they seem to be winning the argument, then back to despair when they realize the argument really is just a facade and the Volturi are willing to kill all of their own witnesses to hide that fact if they have to. Then after all that, Edward casually mentions in the wrap up that because Bella's shield suddenly got way more powerful right at the last minute, they probably could have won because the Volturi have no idea how to fight without all of their cheating magical advantages. After the third or fourth flip flop on if they were definitely doomed or not, I lost what limited ability I had to give a shit. It also reduces Alice's big return from triumphant unbeatable masterstroke to just being the last inconvenience that tipped the Volturi into deciding that this just wasn't their day and they should come back later. And yeah, it's pretty thoroughly confirmed that they will try again, which basically means the big end to the saga isn't an end. It's a deferment. And it makes the Cullens look like short-sighted Egypts, because even taking their extreme selfishness into account, this means they're willing to give up on what is probably going to be the best opportunity they will ever have to face this inevitable conflict as a unified force, and with the enemy as ignorant of their capabilities as they ever will be. If it weren't for the existence of Forever Dawn, I might have been tempted to assume that the last book in the series that shall not be named that came out the year before and did end in an absolute bloodbath of named characters was a big factor in Maya's creative decision. But I do believe Maya when she claims that this was the plan all along, so I think it only really contributed to more people reacting positively to being spared the same emotional hardship in Twilight. While researching for this, my co-writer Kate came across a video Q&A Maya did as part of the Midnight Sun book tour, in which she hints that she's planning to revisit the fate of the Volturi one day in a spin-off book because she knows something has to be done about them eventually, though that only proves how she feels about the situation now, not how she felt back when Breaking Dawn was written. Book 3 was clearly written to showcase that Bella had made it all the way across the board and changed from constantly being a pawn surrounded by radically more powerful pieces to being the queen, the most powerful piece of all. I personally think it would have had more impact if some sort of character development or personal journey had accompanied this transformation, and I must say it's rather telling that despite this hammered in symbolism, it was still Alice and Edward who made the final winning move, not Queen Bella. Even superpowered, she remains a damsel right to the end. As mentioned last time, Lear and Seth have returned back to the non-character void from which they came, leaving me confused and deeply concerned about what I was supposed to feel about the former. I really did not enjoy the hunting scene where Bella kills and feeds on a mountain lion. I mean, they have to hunt to live. It's not sport hunting, which I utterly loathe with every fiber of my being. I think it's just that I like cats a lot more than I like Bella. Edward's last line to Jacob before the battle, goodbye Jacob, my brother, my son, is the worst thing that has ever been said by anyone ever. It's an acknowledgement that he and Jacob were somehow brought closer by their mutual attempts to shag his wife, and that he's now accepted that he is going to shag his daughter someday. So, the name Renezme. Like so many other things in these books, I think what really bothers me is not so much its existence as how it's presented. Maya has stated that she thought of the name so long before she finally published Breaking Dawn, she'd completely forgotten it was atypical in any way, and that shows in the book because everyone acts like it's a really beautiful, appropriate name, and not weird and awkward sounding in the slightest. Was it really too much to ask for for one person to say, what the heck sort of name is that, Bella? It didn't even need to be a main character, I would have taken one of the Volturi or that good vampire who's basically the Avatar. The irony that Bella was getting super upset that everyone was calling her Nessie because it reminded her of the Loch Ness Monster also almost killed me. You named your kid Renezme. You don't get to complain about nicknames that sound significantly less dumb than her full name. There were so many things dropped into this book at the last minute that were then immediately treated as if they'd been a full-fledged part of the story from the start that 
I started to wonder if maybe I was the problem. Like, no one can be this weirdly bad at story structure. I had to be missing something. Some of the vampires who came to join the Cullens right at the end get huge parts in what's left of the story and big epic speeches that could have been performed by Bella, one of the Cullens, or, you know, a character who has actually been in it from the beginning. The Volturi also suddenly start referring to the immortal children, and like, I remember there being isolated incidents of vampires being executed for turning a child, but the way they were using a singular grand title like that really made it sound like there had been one big incident of them having to deal with a whole army of bloodthirsty babies. Worst of all in regards to this, they also casually name drop the Children of the Moon and explain that Jacob and his pack aren't really werewolves, they're actually shapeshifters who just become wolves because they don't know that they actually have other options. Huh. Jacob could have been like an eagle this whole time. How I feel about that. In the wrap-up chapter, Edward, who apparently knew all about this all along and just never thought it was worth mentioning, explains true werewolves are much bigger and nastier, but fortunately quite rare. I wouldn't put it past Myers who write in this weird but ultimately meaningless last second revelation simply because she genuinely believed it was a cool plot twist. It's Possible she was trying to lessen her blatant cultural disrespect slightly by deconflating the werewolf myth with the Native American legend about shapeshifting, but I doubt it because I've seen no evidence she has ever recognized or acknowledged the racism in her writing. Either way, it's yet another example of educated white men explaining things to people of color they were apparently too ignorant to know about themselves. Jacob has been dead to me for a while, but god damn it was just salt in the wound to hear him mansplaining good parenting to his child bride's actual mother. I'm not saying Bella wasn't a bad mum, she was pretty awful, there were some occasions I wasn't even sure she remembered she had a kid. But you know, that still doesn't make Jacob an authority just because he intends to have sex with the kid someday. As mentioned before, Maya is obsessed with describing her characters as whispering, saying things under their breath, and above all, murmuring. This was extra traumatic for me because it was one of the most notable things that E.L. James copy-pasted into her work. The final tally of bloody murmuring comes to 46 times in Twilight, 30 times in New Moon, 95 times in Eclipse, and a last-minute record-breaking 111 times in Breaking Dawn, coming to a total of 282 bloody murmurs. Ah, let's uh, wrap this bad boy up, shall we? We've all got lives to live. Uh, oh, by the way, if you like this shirt, it's available through my Teespring store, which should be linked below. As I said, I'm not surprised that Maya wrote the ending that she wanted and not the one that might have been expected of her, and she did have every reason to think that she could do no wrong regarding this, considering how often she had managed to tap into the desires and fantasies of her fan base that had gone completely ignored by other writers of the time. However, on this occasion, as verified by the Twitter fans still willing to talk to me, this choice kind of split said fan base down the middle, with half of them agreeing with Maya that it would have been too depressing to end on a bittersweet victory with both armies getting decimated in the process, and the other half being as pissed as me that she built towards an actual resolution to the Volturi plot only to pull the rug out from under them at the last minute and force them to listen to Edward be Vinny Gambellini for four bloody chapters just because it would have been kind of a bummer otherwise. You don't often come across a set of books of such a steady decline in quality like this, but I personally found every book in the Twilight Saga to be significantly worse than the last, and when the starting point was mediocre but with some redeeming features, by the time Breaking Dawn rolled around, things had become pretty dire. It's a self-indulgent, rambly, overstuffed mess, and a standout low point in a casually racist, heteronormative, toxic tautology centered around three very boring, mean-spirited, and selfish leads, surrounded by a consistently more interesting, but equally mean-spirited and selfish sidecast. To hell with this book! This is not, I'm afraid to say, the end of my Twilight journey because I made a promise to really try to figure out what the heck was Twilight, and I don't think I've come even close to that yet. However, I think for the sake of my sanity, we're going to backburner it and return to the regularly scheduled programming for a while. Got a sequel adaptation coming up that a lot of people have been looking forward to, and I will hint about in just a moment, but first, a word about our sponsor. In this current era of online connections being all that we can safely have, it's more essential than ever to protect your information and security online using a VPN. My personal favorite being Surfshark, which is currently offering 83% off a two-year plan and three extra months for free if you go to surfshark.deal slash Dominic Noble or follow the link in the video description. I don't know if you've noticed this, but it seems like every bloomin' website under the sun is being pretty open about the fact that they are collecting our information and either using it to manipulate us, sell us things, 
things or sell it to someone who wants to. Using Surfshark stops them from being able to do this by encrypting your incoming and outgoing information as it passes through one of their secure servers located around the world. In addition, a more light-hearted advantage of Surfshark is using their servers to trick websites into thinking you're located in whatever country it's in, meaning you can bypass the ridiculous geo-blocking that stops you from enjoying everything that streaming services like Netflix, Hulu, and Disney Plus have to offer. A single Surfshark account can be used across all of your devices, and as I mentioned before, if you go to surfshark.deal slash Dominic Noble, you get 83% taken off the cost of a two-year plan and an additional three months for free. Huzzah! Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. If I could leave you with the usual reminder that YouTube sometimes acts like it has a will of its own, and that will hates the people making videos on it and will not hesitate to bury any channel that fails to receive enough likes, comments, and shares. So if you wouldn't mind helping to protect me from that fate, I would be much obliged to you. Now, if you would excuse me, I have a displaced royal to read about and a messianic feline who's been waiting quite a while now to make his return to Lost in Adaptation. Well, Edward and Bella are saying farewell as we close the book on this romance from hell. But as they assemble on the back. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, Atel Spurdloff, and Kat Harker. And an extra special thanks to this video's co-producer, Kate Robinson. I would highly recommend checking out her YouTube channel for more of that quality content I know you crave. This isn't part of a scene skein scheme. Why would I not correct that when I saw that it was wrong? I am wrong burgundy and I cannot read things differently. The f Why is this creaking so much? M134 minigun. You can tell I just Googled that. The thing the Terminator uses in uh, Terminator 2. I'm cool.